when I was in elementary school, my ability in art became apparent when I was in third and fourth grade. Everything was done to encourage that. And I had a tendency just to draw the same horse head over and over again. And they said, well, why don't we do uh, the horse's stable? Or maybe we can do something in watercolors. You want to take that art ability and expand it. You get a kid who's obsessed with uh, horses. OK, let's draw its saddle. Let's draw its bridle. Let's, where do you ride the horse to? Let's do some different kinds of horses. You want to take it and broaden it out. But basically, art became the basis of my design career. If you got a little third grader who's good at math, don't make him do baby math. If he can do sixth grade math, let him do sixth grade math. This morning in the hotel, I was looking up the edX site. All kinds of free college classes. If that third grader can do the college calculus, let them do it. Don't hold them back. A lot of kids that are special needs, there's a certain percentage of them that can be very good at one thing, terrible at something else. Educators concentrate way too much on the thing they're terrible at and not enough on the thing they could make into a career. A career in design, a career in computer programming or engineering. One of the problems with autism is such a wide range. All right, let's just start off with little kids. You got little kids, three year old, three year old, four year olds not talking, early intervention. I had very, very good educational early intervention. But once they get past age five, they diverge. You got one group that ought to be working at Silicon Valley. You got another group that maybe can't dress themselves. This autism label covers a wide range. But let's look at the fully verbal kids. The kids have become fully verbal. Build on the strengths. You know, half of Silicon Valley's got some autism. You see, on the mild end of the spectrum, a brain can be more thinking or a brain can be more social-emotional. Well, social-emotional takes up a lot of circuit space in the brain. So there's a point where it's just normal variation, maybe to be a little less social-emotional. One of the things we need to do for these children is they have to be taught social skills in a much more concrete way, the way I was taught social skills in the 50s and the way all kids were taught social skills. And in the 50s, they used a method I call it teachable moments. So if I stir my drink with my finger, mother didn't scream no, she'd say use the spoon. You give the instruction. You tell them how they should behave. It's like training somebody how to behave in a foreign country. Well, not being able to talk is a huge frustration. Mm -hmm. I can remember screaming and throwing my hat on the floor because I didn't want to wear it. And then I tried to chuck it out the car window, which resulted in an accident. You know, not being able to communicate is very, very frustrating. One thing teachers need to do is slow down when they talk to these kids because there's often auditory processing problems. When the grown-ups talked fast, it went into gibberish. I thought grown-ups had a, had a foreign language that was just for grown-ups. If they spoke fast, what happened is the consonant sounds dropped out. So if they said dog, I might hear ugh. So teachers need to slow down and say dog, uh, slow down. And my speech teacher would alternate back and forth between saying dog slowly, the regular way, saying dog fast like that, or then, then going dog, uh, or cop, uh, and then cup. Well, you need to slow down when you talk to them. That's the first thing you need to do. In my business, I started out uh, with some freelance sign painting. First job I ever did was uh, paint a sign for a beauty shop. And then gradually my freelance business went into you know designing Corel systems. But when you do projects, whether it's a sign or whether it's a Corel system, you sell a project, you design it, you supervise its construction, then you start it up. It's all about finishing projects. I think in education we need to be looking a lot more at, well, I'd like to see this little math kid end up in Silicon Valley, not playing video games in the basement. That's where I don't want him to end up. We've got to get the video game playing under control. We don't ban it. But then we've got to replace it with other things and give kids choice. You can say you can do robotics or you could do Boy Scouts. Give them some choices of things to do. You've got to stretch autistic kids. You have to stretch them just outside the comfort zone. Don't chuck them in the deep end of the pool. But if you don't stretch them, they don't develop. And then give them choices of activities. When I was 15, I was afraid to go to my aunt's ranch. If I hadn't gone to my aunt's ranch, I would have never gone into the cattle industry. She gave me a choice. I could go for one week or I could go all summer. And I got out there and I loved it. Well, that again, I looked over your program and I was just at an industrial meeting and they talked about that we got to make sure the process doesn't take over from the goal. And I kind of been looking at the, all the list of the workshops here. We're so into the process since you're administrators that maybe you forget about the goal. Now, I was mainstreamed into a normal classroom by age five. I, I want to do mainstreaming as much as we possibly can. But we also have to look at, let's get this kid just as far as 
get them to go as far as they can go. Um, one, I'll tell you some things I do not want to see. I get asked all the time, what is sustainable agriculture? I'd rather define it by what it's not. Okay, let's look at some things I would consider not acceptable in education. You've got a fully verbal, smart fourth grader that could probably do some math classes on edX, and you've got them in a class with a very severely um, nonverbal that can't dress themselves. That is something that's absolutely not acceptable. I'd almost rather define it by what it's not. And do the same thing in ag when um, they ask me to define sustainability in agriculture. I can think of things that would not be sustainable. Uh, draining the aquifer and running out of water would be a, an example. Well, sensory issues with autism, dyslexia, ADHD, and there's a lot of mixing up of autism and ADHD. Don't get too hung up on diagnosis. I basically go, how old is he? Can he walk? Can he talk? What's he good at? What's he bad at? I mean, sensory problems. Sensory problems are very variable. I had problems with sound sensitivity and scratchy clothing. Somebody else got visual sensitivity problems. Another person does not have them, and I'm one of the ones who does not have them. Sensory issues are exceedingly variable. But I'm a bottom-up thinker. I think with specific examples. For example, specific examples of what would be not inclusive education, specific examples of what would be not sustainable agriculture. That's where I tend to start. Situations I don't want to see. And then I'm really flexible in wanting to let people innovate on other kinds of things. If you want to train a computer to read x-rays, computers are very good at reading x-rays now. You train it with all the x-ray, with thousands of x-rays. This one's got cancer, this one doesn't. This one's got suspicious. And then the program learns to read them from all those specific examples that have been fed into it. That's how an AI system works. Well, I, OK, bullying is a big problem in school. What do we do with that? The only places I was not bullied was where there was a shared interest. So get these kids into art, band, theater, uh, um, auto shop, uh, robotics. Because where I had friends was with the shared interests. This is another reason why you need all these other hands-on classes. Because they expose kids to career options. Theater's a good career option. That's not going to get replaced by robots or computers. People are still going to want to go to theater. That's a good career. I want to see kids get out there and get into good careers. Also, as I go back and forth between the educational world, the autism world, and the building things and design things world, I've worked with so many designers. Yes, and when I went to the Emmys, that was a lot of fun. And I talked to some people there about some big fancy directors. Uh, had a lot of anxiety problems similar to me. Um, I take antidepressants to control my anxiety. Um, I've worked with a lot of people out in the professional world that are undiagnosed on the mild autism spectrum. I want to see kids be successful. And if a smart kid ends up playing video games in the basement, instead of working for Google in construction, it's called a failed project. We've got to get looking a lot more at the outcomes. And I'm very concerned with all the titles of the workshops I've seen here, you're too much into the process and not enough into the outcome. Kid gets, in the, gets out there, good career, stays out of trouble with the law, you know, maybe has a family, has a reasonably happy life, and contributes to society. Okay. And then we've got, problem we got with autism, is yes, there is a segment that's going to have to live in a supervised living situation. Uh, they can't dress themselves, they can't do basic things, and unfortunately they got the same name same diagnostic name as somebody that ought to go to Silicon Valley. The other thing we've got to remember about these diagnostic labels, doctors keep changing them over the years. Nobody's changing the diagnosis for strep throat. That has stayed the same for years and years and years and years with a very definitive test. Just the other day, I saw a sign in a meatpacking plant, the seven cardinal rules of safety. Yeah, up there at the top of the list, lock out, tag out. You know what that is? You lock out the machine so that when you're doing the maintenance on it, somebody else doesn't turn that grinder on with you in it. That's called lockout, tagout. That's your number one safety rule. That's a lot more important than whether or not somebody puts a lid on a coffee cup on a British Petroleum oil rig. And they were doing that, but they forgot about process safety. You know what happened to that oil rig? It blew up. Yeah, there's some things with pressure tests that are a lot more important than lids on coffee cups. And in food safety, it's called critical control points. What are the really important things? And this plant had the six most important safety rules where you can die or lose a limb. And number seven was, 
If the boss tells an employee to disobey one of the six, you can be fired. You see, it's looking at the relatively few things that are really super important and not getting lost in a whole lot of minutia. Teaching social rules the old-fashioned way that we were taught in the 60s. Lots of opportunities for doing different things like art, music, theater, engineering, uh, mathematics, uh, things that can turn into careers. The other thing is work skills. That needs to start with chores for little kids. If you belong to a church or, any, or a community center, uh, volunteer jobs, it needs to be on a schedule outside the home, walking dogs for the neighbors, and the instant they're of legal age, a real job in the summertime. Got to learn how to work. That is something that's essential. The little ones, we got to teach them turn taking. It's another absolute essential. That was taught to me at five years old with board games. You got to learn how to wait and take your turn. I'm seeing 13 year olds that are fully verbal who are getting so overprotected, they've never gone in a store and bought something. I was buying things in stores when I was seven. I was given 50 cents a week for allowance. I knew exactly what I could buy with that. I could get 10 candy bars, five comics, but if I wanted a 69 cent airplane, I had to save for two weeks. Well, I guess today it's gonna be $5 rather than 50 cents. And little trinkets like candy bars and comics and little balsa wood airplanes, mother never bought those things. Those things came out of our allowance. Uh, and all the kids in the neighborhood had that, that taught using money. These basic things like this uh, is what we need to be doing with a lot of these kids. And I'm seeing too many situations where they're getting overprotected. Some moms just can't let go. When I suggested that her kids should be able to go into the office supply store and buy some paper, she started to break down crying. I'm talking about shopping. And this is just in the last year that I ran into this kid. This is not something from a long time ago. Not everyone on the autism spectrum is a photorealistic visual thinker like me, but they tend to have uneven skills. You can have the pattern thinker mathematics kits that are gonna be very good with programming and computer stuff. Then you have another kind of mind. This is the kid that loves history, and it's all about words. See, there's a real tendency to be good at one thing and totally terrible at something else. I was totally terrible in algebra. The algebra requirement is screening out a lot of good visual thinkers. And we need our visual thinkers to prevent accidents like Fukushima. That was a huge, huge visual thinking mistake. And what I've learned about the mathematical mind, they don't see obvious things, like water filling up the basement and drowning the emergency cooling system that runs on electricity. That is something so basic it blew my mind that that was the reason why it, um, it burned up. I can't design a nuclear reactor, but all I know is that when I need that cooling pump, if it doesn't work, I'm in so much trouble, it's not funny. I think one of the things a lot of educators need to do is get out of their silo. I've made a point in my speaking engagements to go across silos. I just did a meeting with industrial trainers just earlier this week. It was a great meeting. Uh, then I'm out on a construction site. I was just out at the meat plant and I saw this great sign with the seven cardinal rules going back and forth between the different silos and then seeing how I can I can take information from one silo and use it in another silo. Uh, there needs to be a lot more interdisciplinary. And educators need to learn more about business. Here's some magazines that need to be in your library. How about some Business Week, some Fortune, some Wall Street Journal, uh, Wired Magazine, Science and Nature, so they can see this really cool stuff that they could grow up and be. But they can't dream about it if they don't know about it. There's a big world out there and it's not just video game design. There's a lot of stuff out there that's much cooler than that. We need to start looking at what is really important. See, I really like the food safety critical control point approach. Relatively few things. Let's look at like traffic rules. If you could only enforce five traffic rules, there's only five of them you need to enforce to get most of your public safety. And traffic rules are simple. Use that for a model. Speeding, drunk driving, stopping violations, seat belts, and texting. That's probably going to deal with most of the traffic accidents. The first main point I'm going to be talking about in my talk, I'm going to show a picture of Jane Goodall. What would happen to her today with a two-year secretarial degree? How about Thomas Edison, a hyperactive adult high school dropout? What would happen to him today? What would happen to Steven Spielberg, dyslexic, not a very good student, rejected from a top film school. What happened to these innovators today? We want to make sure that the kids that are coming into the system now that may be kind of different, they end up with uh, good outcomes. 
I'm going to talk about the different kinds of minds. The visual thinkers, the artists, the pattern mathematical thinkers, and the word thinkers. And I'm very concerned about the visual thinkers getting screened out by algebra. Why not let them take uh, geometry? Why is algebra so important? Uh, and learning how working skills, getting out in the workforce, get out and be everything they can be. And, and uh, you want to, well, we've learned in my industry, and even like airlines have learned this. Okay, like Southwest Airlines, Herb Kellerman would get out and do an actual job. United Airlines used to be the worst on time schedule, grumpy, nasty staff. Got a new CEO, Oscar. And within two weeks, I saw a difference because he went out in the field and talked to the staff, and they were less grumpy. He put more time in the schedule because you can't de ice a plane in five minutes. But these are things he only learned when he got out in the airport and actually found out what was going on on the ground. See, a lot of people are making policy. I don't care if it's education or anything else, they need to get the butt out of the office and go down in the field. You can take samples. You can't look, supervise every school. But just take samples. What's going on here? What's failing? What's, uh, what's working? And probably a lot less top-down thinking. In many fields, there's way too much jargon and gobbledygook. And I've been an editor of um, you know, several uh, books on, in livestock handling, and I'm always pulling out the jargon. Call it a cow, don't call it by its Latin name. You know, get rid of a lot of the jargon. And I'll tell you, the Latin names in anatomy, they mean stupid things. Like, for example, in the brain, the membrane on the brain, the duramata, is a tough mother in Latin. Uh, that's certainly not very scientific sounding. You know, so when students are taking anatomy class, let's just translate them into English and we can really laugh about it. They just name them stupid things like what they look like. No, get rid of jargon. Explain things in straightforward, simple language. Has to be precise language. But cow is just as precise as the Latin word for them. Well, leadership is, you know, uh, we, I, I want to be more precise in leadership. I want to talk about what is a leader leading. Something more specific that the leader is leading. You could have, I'm now thinking of a school I went to that had a very good principal. His teachers were doing really well, the students were doing well. That's an example of a leader. And they had all the different career classes and art and music and theater and uh, uh, the farm classes and uh, things where kids could try on a lot of careers. And the worst leader is the egomaniac that absolutely thinks he can do, he's an expert on totally everything. No, I'm the kind of person where, okay, most of my work was before there was internet. If I didn't know something, I'd say, I will tell you tomorrow, and I'd be on the phone finding out. Today, whip the phone out, look it up on Google right there in front of them. Yeah, let's just find out right now. But an egomaniac won't do that.